This week marks an unbelievable anniversary, one that some of the youngsters here would have made them literally this week come of age, the age 21, which in the West is considered the age that you have become finally a grown adult. 21 years ago this week, brothers from all over the Muslim world, black, white, Asian, brown, Arabs, Iranians, Pakistanis, Africans, from all over the world were taken to a place that the Adhan had never been heard before. A 45 square mile patch in Cuba, controlled by the US government, that had been made into the world's most infamous prison. Yes, there are prisons all around the world where people are tortured and abused and violated, but this prison was going to be special because the inmates of this prison, the first condition to be an inmate of this prison was that you had to be a Muslim. That was the first condition. If you were from Mauritania, if you were from Sierra Leone, from Nigeria, from Pakistan, from Iran, from Jordan, from Sweden, from Belgium, from Australia, it didn't matter. What they did in this prison is what the Ummah has never done over the past several hundred years. In this prison, they united us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on to the rope of Allah and be not disunited. And we have been a disunited community for hundreds of years now. Yet when our enemy looks at us and looks at us in this way, they see us as one. They see us as one, though we are disunited. And you see in Guantanamo, my dear brothers and sisters, not only was it the first condition to be a prisoner there that you're a Muslim, you also had people there from the American soldiers who saw the practice of these prisoners and were so enamored to it that they took their shahada in the prison. Men, women, black, white, Hispanic, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. I saw some of those with my own eyes and some of them have visited me in my home after years of abusing and torturing us. Because in the end, we know as Muslims that the Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-dunya sijn al-mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This life, this temporal life, is a prison for the believer and a paradise for one who does not believe. And this religion of ours was built upon the shoulders of lions. And when we inherit their legacy, you can see, and I want to give you just a one example, a couple of examples of brothers that I've come across. You know, recently I visited uh, Morocco, and I met one brother. His name is Abdul Latif. He was imprisoned in Guantanamo without charge, without trial. No visits, no TV, no canteen, no association, no pool tables, no table tennis. 20 years without charge or trial. He came back home with a smile on his face. Another brother, Sufyan Barhumi, I sp spoke to him recently. Held in Guantanamo for 19 years without charge or trial, he's Algerian became disabled because they amputated his fingers while he was there. Came back home, beaming with a smile. Beaming with a smile. Yes, they broke our bodies. They tried to break our family relations. They tried to break the very nature of human beings, which is to be free. But what they didn't do is break the spirit, the heart, and the faith of the brothers. And how could they? When this is the religion of the Prophet والسلام, you know when he died? You know when he died? The Sahaba were destitute. 
they were upset, they couldn't believe it. That the rahmat lil alameen has passed away. Their guide, their teacher, their defender has passed. And Umar ibn Khattab famously said, anybody who says that the Prophet ﷺ has passed away, I will strike his neck. Because he couldn't believe it. And then, Abu Bakr, of whom the Prophet ﷺ said, Arhamu ummati bi ummati, the most merciful of my ummah to my ummah is Abu Bakr. Wa ashiddum fi amrillah Umar. Umar was supposed to be the toughest, but what did Abu Bakr say? Abu Bakr said, he stood up and he said, Ya, ya Nas, Man kana ya'bud Muhammad fa innahu qad mat. Whoever worshipped Muhammad, know that he has passed away. Wa man kana ya'bud Allah fa innahu hayyun la yamut. And whoever worshipped Allah, let him know that he is alive and can never die. And that most merciful of the ummah that day became the rock that held the ummah together. Similarly, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, every single day in Guantanamo, there's this battle that takes place in the airwaves. The American military is required by protocol to stand, the soldiers, all of us, all of them who are guarding us, that at night, at Maghrib time, precisely at Maghrib time, the American national anthem blares across the loudspeakers, massive loudspeakers. And they're required to stop wherever they are, face this giant American flag, stop and salute it. Precisely at Maghrib time, what are the brothers doing? What are the brothers doing at, at Maghrib time, precisely at that time? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So there's a battle between the American national anthem and the airwaves and the adhan. One group does this and one group does that. Which is sincere? Which does it from its heart? Which does it five times a day? Which is connected to it? Which does it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata kanat ala mu'minina kitaban mawquta. That prayers were fixed at their prescribed times. This is the legacy. This is what's come out of Guantanamo, the stories that perhaps you don't even understand and know that there are prisoners there and they've been abused and they've been tortured and they're broken. No, my dear brothers, I'm here to tell you something totally different on this 21st anniversary. Yes, there were around 800 prisoners there, 779 in total. Now there's only 35 left. 35 left, 20 of whom have been cleared for release. Just this week, two brothers from Pakistan, they're called the Rabbani brothers, Ghulam Rabbani, Ghulam Ahmed Rabbani, and Badr. They've been cleared for release for more than one year. Two Pakistanis. We hope that they're going to be released very soon. One of them comes home to see two children, one of whom he's never met in his life, and the other who is so young, he doesn't remember what it, has to be, what it is to have a father. And we call that, in our work, in the work that we do, a success story. Somebody freed after 20 years, without charge, without trial, held by the world's most vociferous advocate of human rights and freedom. Allahu Akbar. Freedom. So let me just say that freedom, some of you may have tasted its loss. Some of you may know have been detained at detention centers for a few hours, detained for months, detained for years even in prison. But we of the Ummah of whom it is related that, uh, that Umar ibn Khattab said when one of the Sabahaba is reported to have imprisoned somebody for a short time, i.e. stopped him from leaving a certain confined space for a short time, he said, Mata nas wa qad waladat umhatum ahrar. When is it that you enslaved people while their mothers gave birth to them as free men? Look at the freedom, the concept of freedom, its intrinsic value within Islam. The idea of imprisoning people for decades on end is alien to Islam. Yes, the punishments exist and the retribution and the society exists whereby 
a person has access to justice. But how is it justice to detain people for decades and then claim to be a defender of human rights? It's the greatest irony that you can imagine. So my dear brothers and sisters, you will probably not hear much of these stories from many people because they're out of sight, out of mind. But it is crucial for us to understand as an ummah that we are only as strong as our weakest link. You know when they say, when some of the people go training and running and so forth, those who care about the entire group, they say that put the one who is the weakest at front, he will lead. So that everybody behind him will push him. The stronger people will push him. But if you leave him behind, then the next person that's weak will get left behind. And then in the end, you'll find yourself running all by yourself. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. My dear brothers and sisters, I wasn't going to tell you this story because I've told it many times, so forgive me if, I've, if, if you've heard it before. But a brother on the way here said to me that you should tell this story, so I will. When I was first taken into American custody by the, um, by the US military in Pakistan, they were taking me onto an aircraft. And they took me with my hands tied behind my back into the ruku position, bowing. So I was forced down by two American soldiers. And they pushed me onto the floor of this air cargo transport plane. And I had a hood over my head, my hands shackled behind my back, my, my legs shackled. They pushed me down. I heard the sounds of the dogs barking, the roar of the engines. The flashes I could make out, even though I've got a black bag over my head, I could make out they're taking trophy pictures. And the screaming, they're cursing at us in Arabic, Urdu, whatever new words they've learnt, English. And then they forced me down onto this cargo plane and they put a strap across my legs, a strap across uh, through my arms. And I'm in a state of terror. This is a war on terror, but it's a war of terror. And at this moment, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I'll ever see my family again. And then uh, I hear a voice to the left of me, and somebody says, Salaam Alaikum. I say, Wa Alaikum as -salam. We speak in Arabic. And he, he's a Libyan in the same position as me. And the next question he asked, he said, Akhi hal sallayta salat al maghrib? Brother, did you pray salat al maghrib? Ya Salam, I don't know about Dhuhr or Asr, he's asking about Maghrib. I don't know about life or death, and he's saying, Akhi, a Salah, a Salah. Imagine this Salah. And I say to him, SubhanAllah, khiyar, no, I haven't prayed. And then I said, you're on the left, so you lead the prayer. So how do you lead the prayer? I want you to think about this. None of that, none of that. No ruku, no sujood, no sajda. No facing the Qibla, no standing. How do you pray like that? And as he was talking to me, an American soldier comes up to me and puts a knife right to my throat. And he says, if you speak again, and he swears, I'll slit your throat. And at this point, the brother says, Allahu Akbar. And that's the beginning of my first prayer in American custody. My hands behind my back and a hood over my head and a knife to my neck. So think to yourself, what excuse do we ever have? Could there be an excuse? Where the qawm, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, sitting, or lying down, whichever position, it doesn't matter. My dear brothers and sisters, I made tayammam. Does everybody know what tayammam is? Dry ablution, no water for one year. And so did hundreds of my brothers because they only gave us this bottle, that much to drink. You are, if you want to use that for wudu, you've got nothing to drink for one year. Do you think that broke our iman or built it? This 
is our legacy. Nations around the world, they, they uh, celebrate the sacrifices of their prisoners, don't they? They celebrate it. They don't flee from it, they celebrate it and say, look, subhanAllah, look at this. And I don't say this of myself because I was only there for three years. But what about those who were there for 20 years and held on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their molar teeth? Why don't we celebrate them? Nations are built upon sacrifice. You have a statue of Nelson Mandela outside parliament. They used to hate him. They used to call for him to be hanged. And yet 27 years in prison. Even your enemy is going to respect you then. Even your enemy is going to respect you. Why are we afraid? Why don't we even know the names that I just mentioned to you? Why the fear? My dear brothers and sisters, you know, there's this brother I met also in Morocco. His name is Ahmed al-Rashid. And inshallah, tomorrow I will be doing a, an event in uh, the Memon Center in Balam at 6 o'clock. Uh, inshallah, there will be brothers giving you details about it. But if you want to come and listen to the testimony of Abdul Latif, who was in prison for 20 years, and this brother I'm going to tell you about now, please do come. It will be by video, unfortunately, but they will be there and I will be talking to them. Ahmed al-Rashidi. What they used to do, brothers and sisters, is that they, in the beginning, the Qur'an, the Qur'an, you know, the book that we love, that you see on the shelves around you, that you live by and die by, they tore it up into pieces and threw it into the toilet in front of our eyes. But it's okay. It's okay. After all, it's just paper and ink. And Allah says in that paper and ink, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. If they were to destroy every Quran in the world, everyone right now, today, it wouldn't make an iota of a difference to the Muslim Ummah. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. When the Prophet ﷺ first revealed, got, got the revelation, the angel Jibreel came to him and he said, Iqara bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. And what was his response? Ma ana biqari. I cannot read. The Quran bears testimony that he's a Nabi al-Ummi, the unlettered prophet. But did that stop him from teaching the Sahaba? He taught it from his mouth and it went straight to their hearts. And they wrote it down on Pete's parchments. But the only reason why it put together in a book in the first place, my dear brothers and sisters, is because those who had memorized the Quran were coming to its defense when Musaylim al-Kadhab, claiming to be a false prophet, or claiming to be a prophet, uh, came and claimed to have his own revelation. So the Sahaba went and fought him, the Ahlul Sufa, those who'd memorized the Quran the most, and they were getting killed one by one in its defense. And the Sahaba said, if we do not put this into one compiled volume, I fear, we fear that the Quran will be lost. See, the Quran was always dictated to people's hearts ever before it was in a book. And so when they ripped the Qur'an and they came into our cells while we were gone for interrogations, they spat upon it and we'd find swear words written on it and boot prints on it. We'd say, Ahmad al-Rashidi, this brother, he said, I'm going to organize the brothers. Take back the Qur'an. Imagine the Qur'an that gives you the most solace that everything else is unfamiliar to you. The air, the food, the colors, the geography, everything, the people is unfamiliar, but this book this book never changes. This book doesn't matter whether you're from a Uyghur from East Turkestan in China, who's in Guantanamo, or whether you're from Senegal, or whether you're from Morocco, or whether you're from Pakistan. This book does not change. So we gave back the Qur'ans to the abuser, to the oppressor, to the violator. But we learned the Qur'an. Those who knew taught who those who didn't. Word of mouth. The Prophet ﷺ said, man al wa allama. The best of you are those who learned the Qur'an and taught it. And wouldn't it please you to hear, my brothers and sisters, let alone the Muslims in Guantanamo memorize the Qur'an. Many of them did hift this way. But even some of the soldiers I told you about learned some of the Qur'an in this way. The enemy. 
those who were told that these are the worst of the worst. So, my brothers and sisters, you know, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for us, still to remain in our hearts. We memorized it. We acted upon what we could of it. We reflected upon it. We discussed it with other brothers. Brothers that we would never have known or seen before had it not been for this place. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us wherever the khair, the good was, and for us to be pleased with his decree upon us. Yes, our fathers and our mothers and our sisters and our children were away from us. But this dunya is fana. It's something that will come to an end. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى That the akhirah, the akhirah, the hereafter, is better and forever. So we should do as what the Prophet ﷺ said, and I say this to myself and all of you, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَغَرِيبٍ أَوْ عَابِرِ السَّبِيلِ Be in this dunya as a stranger, or somebody that's just passing along. Just passing along. In the end, that's all it is. And that's how all the brothers I speak to you about, 20 years, 21 years, some people are still there, as I said. Who knows when they'll be released? Who knows? Maybe there will be another anniversary after another 10 years. I've never met one former Guantanamo prisoner that's gone through trials like I've told you, that has ever become deus, has ever become somebody that is hopeless of the mercy of Allah. Never met one. So whatever difficulties you are going through, and I know many brothers are going and sisters are going through very great difficulties, even as we speak, financial, uh, health, social, religious. لا تيأسوا من رحمة الله Never become despondent or hopeless for the mercy of Allah. It will come. And that's what distinguishes us from other ummas. Every action we begin, every surah except for one, begins with, with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wasiat rahmatuhu kulla shay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy expands everything and covers and goes beyond everything. And in the end, it is that mercy that we hope for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us. Allahumma azza al-Islam wal-Muslimin wa dhill al-Shirk wal-Kafir wa adha al-Din. اللهم أضرب الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرج المسلمين من بين أيديهم سالمين اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا على طاعتك يا رب العالمين اللهم فق قيد إخواننا المأسورين وردهم إلى أهلهم سالمين غانمين اللهم فق قيد إخواننا المأسورين وردهم إلى أهلهم سالمين غانمين يا رب العالمين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters um, It's an honor for me to, hear, to come here to give the khutbah in uh, Lushim Masjid uh, it is one of the places that is always, always stands for helping the oppressed, stands for justice, uh, stands for the truth. So please make dua for all of the idara, for the administration of this masjid, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them the best in this dunya and akhirah and protects them from all evil. Wa sallallahu sallim ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa qima salah. Sorry, excuse me.